Okay, good. Um, so what I want to do is I go into the instrumentation of MEG, and it's quite important actually to be able to interpret your data, obviously. Um, this is very, very extremely familiar for everyone, but it just belongs here. Um, we have presynaptic potentials causing postsynaptic potentials, right? It's the postsynaptic potential that we're measuring with EEG and MEG, not the presynaptic potential. Um, the presynaptic potential results in neurotransmitter release, which results in depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron, which results in the postsynaptic potential. The reason why we are measuring the postsynaptic potential and not the presynaptic potential is several folds. First of all, uh, the presynaptic potential is extremely short lived in the order of milliseconds. And it's also biphasic, it goes up and down. So this means that it's very, very hard for these potentials to sum up into a significant signal that we can measure on the scalp level. The postsynaptic potential is much longer, takes like about you know, in orders of tens of milliseconds, and it's also monophasic. So it's slow and it's monophasic, and in this way, it's possible for these potentials to sum up. So obviously, what we are recording are, are neurons, especially of the cortex, where they are oriented parallel. So that also geometrically, uh, the neuron uh, populations can sum up and generate a significant summed up potential. Um, it's also particular neurons that we are measuring. We are measuring mainly the big pyramidal cells, which have their orientation vertically, like perpendicular to the, to the cortex, and they're innervated on the dendrites, and then the postsynaptic potential travels down to the soma, where they're summed up and, uh, and might result in the postsynaptic potential again. So it's this sort of geometric configuration uh, that's able to sum up into an electrical potential. But as you know, um, electrical potential also creates a magnetic field um, via the right-hand rule. Everybody knows the right-hand rule. So if we take a, a look at a bit, bit bigger, zoom out a bit, um, we can see that there are sort of geometrically two kinds of dipoles that we might be, that we might want to measure. There are radial dipoles, which are oriented radially to the scalp surface. And those generate an electric field that we can measure with EEG. But for several reasons, radial dipoles we cannot measure with MEG. And it's a bit, it's very complicated to explain. It's got a lot of sort of mathematics and physics in it that I don't even understand. Um, but there are two sort of general ideas that you can uh, intuitively take, at least take into a consideration. Uh, first of all, uh, each electric field, so this is the postsynaptic potential, generates, so this is called the, um, the, the primary current, and it generates return currents, right? If you have a symmetrical situation like here, so oriented radially to, let's say, sort of a salt sphere, like an approximation of a skull, of a head, uh, the return currents are also symmetrical. And so these return currents also generate magnetic fields and thereby cancel out the primary current. Um, we'll also see another aspect of it uh, in a moment when you look at the sensors where the magnetic field that's generated here is in the same plane as the sensor. So it's also a reason why we're not picking it up. Um, there's a third variation, which you should know, which is if you place this dipole to the center of the sphere, to the center of the head, then it doesn't matter which direction it's oriented, it's always oriented radially. Yeah? yeah. So a deep source will always be radially and will be uh, hard to uh, see with MEG as well. Um, Different situation occurs with tangential dipoles. Um, for one, as you can see with MEG, um, the return currents are not symmetric. So they do not cancel each other out, so we can measure it. 
Secondly, the magnetic field points out and goes through the coils, through the, through the coils that, that are uh, located here, actually uh, radially to the, to the dipole. Um, both, in principle, are sort of visible with EEG. It says not visible, it's, it's less visible, but it's still visible. So with MEG, you measure pretty much everything except the radial dipoles. And in practice, this is not often really much of a problem because the cortex never really is exactly uh, uh, radial to the, to, the, to, the, to the skull. But if you want to compare areas, then you might get this problem that you just have different sensitivities. So if you take even, we zoom out even more, we get a dipole here in the head um, with a primary current that is picked up if you would place, let's say, an electrode here and a reference electrode, let's say, on the nose, another electrode here and a reference electrode on the nose, we see a positive uh, uh, um, field potential here and a negative one here. That's the picture you know from EET. So if you have this picture in EEG, you know the source is here in the middle, right? With MEG, you see that the field distribution is, is rotated 90 degrees. So convention is that uh, red is where the, electric, the magnetic field goes out and blue is where it goes in. It's just a convention. It really doesn't mean anything except that. So notice this. There's a 90 degree orientation of your dipoles with MEG. Um, so let's, let's start with what, what we are measuring, how the, how the sensors work in the, in the MEG. Uh, the most simple sensors are the magnetometers. And maybe this is the first time you hear the word, so that's why you can, might encode it right. It's not magnetometer. I make a problem out of this with everyone, but it's a magnetometer and I actually have, oh, if I would have had internet, which you didn't think of, you can actually check Merriam-Webster where it pronounces the words. <laughs> so I had like conversation with, I mean, pretty much, the, you know, seminal figures in MEG and uh, I stick, stuck to my point on, and this now makes, uh, makes a good, uh, good proof. So a magnetometer, uh, li just like thermometer. Uh, anyway, um, the fields from the uh, magnetic fields from the brain are extremely, extremely small. So they're like a, um, a million times smaller than the Earth magnetic field, and that's already like a, a hundred times smaller than a refrigerator magnet. They're extremely small. So one of the things we have to do is become very sensitive. So we need to amplify to to a degree the magnetic field, which is done via flux transformers. So this is flux transformer. Um, it's placed as closely as possible to the head. We'll see how this works in practice in the machine. Um, so that it can pick up magnetic fields. Right? Now, the whole thing is made of a superconductive metal. And the big bulk of the MEG is the liquid helium that cools it down to almost absolute zero, to like a 3, 4 Kelvin. And in this situation, the, the, the element becomes superconductive which means that there's no net magnetic, no net uh, resistance in the whole thing. Which means that if there can't be any net resistance, or net, sorry, net, net current uh, in, the, in, the, in the flux transformer, <coughs> that any field here in the big coil will have to be compensated by a stronger, more dense magnetic field in the, opposite, in the, in the small coil. So this is what then becomes strong enough for us to measure with a, a superconductive quantum interference device. So, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's an extremely weak signal and very strong noise. Oh, this is the... So we need very sensitive magnetic detectors. So one thing is that we need them very sensitive, but secondly, we become very sensitive, but we also become very sensitive to all these other sources of magnetic fields that distort the signal. I mean, we are really like millions of orders of degrees smaller than most of the noise around us. So one way we do this is via passive shielding. Um, this is the first magnetically shielded room developed by Cohen in uh, 69. Uh, since then we've progressed, but the principle remains the same. 
And this is the one, these are some pictures from the, from the uh, installation of the magnetic shielded room here at, uh, in, the, in the basement uh, at our lab. So um, aspects of this, of this shielded room is that it, 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 it's, it, it blocks magnetic fields from the outside, mainly by bending it around it. But well, this is passive shielding. Um, we have a really good passive shielded room, a magnetic shielded room. It's, it's beyond the, the, the specifications that we would need, actually. Um, but if we would move, let's say the plan was for a while to move to the, the hospital site, uh, next to MRs, next to elevators, etc., etc., then we maybe were looking into adding another layer. So these layers can be, I mean, these doors, these, these rooms can become very, very thick just to uh, block the magnetic um, fields from the outside. But we'll always have, for instance, holes in the room where we have to pass through cables. Um, and also certain, this blocks mainly the, um, the high frequency uh, magnetic fields, but the low frequency magnetic fields typically always, there's some that pass through. So it's not always enough to just have a passively shielded system. We always also have active shielding. And this was new to me when I came here from the Donner Center where we don't have this. Um, um, but there's two. There's like a, a external active shielding and there's an internal active shielding. The external active shielding um, in Daniel's office, uh, in on the wall of his office, just above the, the plates, there are several coils, several very sensitive magnetic sensors that pick up the magnetic field, constant magnetic field. And then there's some equipment between it, which cancels this one out of the MEG signal measured. So there's the, the static magnetic field from the external magnetic field that is already being canceled out or compensated in the, in, in the MEG. But then we also have shifting, changing magnetic fields that come from the outside out of the room. And that's a very sophisticated technique where within the MEG system, uh, we'll, get a, we'll get a better picture of, of, of how it looks from the inside. But uh, there are several sensors of the, uh, that, you, that you use to measure, but you now measure them not just for the brain measurement, but you use them as reference sensors. So those, the activity that it picks up, actually it subtracts from the rest. So it calculates based upon several sensors what the magnetic field, the external magnetic field is, and it cancels this one out. And so how it does that is by within the shielded room there are big coils that generate magnetic fields to compensate for the ones that are measured uh, in the helmet. So it's just like your sound cancellation micro, uh, headphones that you have for in the airplane. Uh, we typically now have that on. I, I was very skeptical at first, like if this would work because you have to do some compensation afterwards, but it really, really works really well. You can you know, make, make big artifacts and it cancels it out. It does mean that you have to always have this additional operation of adjusting. Sorry? Uh, yeah. uh, I suppose the answer is no, but I will just make the question anyway. Because mm -hmm. um, we have TMS, which uses magnetic stimulation. Uh, can this active shielding somehow interfere in measuring signal in the mag? Uh, you want to do TMS in the MEG? No, I'm, I'm just wondering if you're creating magnetic fields trying to take out the noise. Yes, you do. And that's the reason why you have to have this step in between to actually, um, because so, let's say these reference sensors are put to zero in a way. What you measure there is, 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 is put to zero as much as possible through uh, activating these magnetic coils. Right, so it's this feedback loop of trying to reduce it. Yeah. So this means that some of these sensors are then turned zero, and then you have to kind of uh, add that 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 to the channels back again to sort of like compensate for the uh, for the reduction, so that you can use these channels again. Yeah. But I wonder what's the difference between TMS and, and this shielding. My my idea would be: is it possible that it's active shielding? somehow interfere with the signal you want to make. Oh, oh, no, so the, so the point is that, that the magnetic fields are generated in the room, right? So not on the head. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, so it's in, it's in the outside, so it's, it won't kind of like generate magnetic fields sort of like in the brain. Some kind of 
neuroactivation or something? No, yeah, exactly. Operation. No, yeah, okay. yeah. It's, um, and, ag and again, I mean, these magnetic fields are extremely small. Okay. Um, there, I have this picture where you compare it with, M with MRI, and I think TMS might be even as, I mean, then you're like, how much are you stimulating with? Like, I think several Tesla, right? So one to two. TMS, yeah. I don't know, one to two. Yeah, and this is minus 16. Okay. So, the, the, the. Yeah, okay, same. Yeah. So, so we have active shielding, we have passive shielding, and then maybe the most uh, efficient way of, of getting rid of noise and being uh, of, of environmental noise is smart sensor designs. So, what we want to, to understand this, we have to look at the sensitivity profile of these different sensors. So, first the magnetometer, the simplest situation. Imagine you have a Magnetic uh, electric dipole here with a magnetic field, like this. And you place the flux transformer coil of the, of the magneto mag magnetometer <laughs> uh, just <laughs> off the center of the, of, of the dipole. What you see is then it will pick up this magnetic field uh, and, and that will, will be able to measure that. If you move it now on top of the, uh, the dipole, it will have a magnetic field that's planar to the, it's in the same, same plane as the magnetometer, so it won't pick up anything at this point. So it's one of the reasons why these radial dipoles are not being picked up. And of course, when you move it even further, you get like the opposite. You get a, uh, a magnetic field in the opposite direction. But it will be very sensitive to everything, this one. So also very much to environmental noise. So what we have then is the gradiometer, and I will just explain you, I think, one version, the one we have here in, the, in our system, which is the planar gradiometer. So these are two magnetometers, but they're oriented in the opposite direction. So it's a figure of eight, which means that if we place it here, we have, it picks up the strong, so it picks up the source underneath, but it also, but it picks up much less outside of the source, further, further away from the source. Are you right? So the difference, sorry, the difference is the signal you'll be picking up. But now if we introduce environmental noise, the thing about environmental noise is that it's far, it's far away. So the, the amount of, of magnetic fields that, from the environmental noise that go through the coils is equal to both magnetometers. So they cancel each other out. So that's how you would use a, a smart sensor design. The sensitivity profile of this one also has another feature that if you place it right above the, the, the dipole, its sensitivity becomes largest. It picks up both the down as the up going field. Ah, and there's a planar radiometer. This is one that, for instance, the CTF systems have, like in the Donder Center. Um, here you have a similar figure of eight, but it's in the planar direction. And also this one picks up magnetic fields uh, from, the, from the source and f a little bit further away from the source. And this difference is what you'll have as an output of the channel. And similarly, environmental noise penetrates both in the same way and cancel each other out. So I'll stand here for some people. So if we now look at the distance to the source and the sensitivity profile of the uh, magnetometers. You'll see that it is most sensitive right on the edge of the dipole and then it decays over time. And also you see this flipping polarity. So the magnetometer is very sensitive to also distant sources but of course also to distant environmental noise. And so this environmental noise is suppressed with an actual radiometer. And it becomes much more sensitive to the dipole underneath the, the coils, or slightly off the coils. Actually, that's a better place, right? Um, and then we have the platical radiometer configuration, which is one that we'll be working with uh, together with the magnetometers, which has its biggest sensitivity right above the source, and it decays sharply to the edges. Yeah. So 
if you understand this, you really understand the huge, huge difference between EEG and MNG because you have to try to interpret these topographies. And we'll go through the different magnetometers and radiometers uh, and EEG for the tutorial. So just to um, describe our system a bit better in detail, it's Electroneuromach Triux. It has 102 magnetometers and 204 planar radiometers. So 306 channels. And the, the flux transformer coils and the squids are all placed upon a chip, so on a 2D surface. And it's very efficient, it's very smart, because you, I'll, I'll show you in a moment how it's organized, but here you can already see it's a possibility of creating two figures of eight. And the magnetometer is the one that goes all around. And so they're all in exactly the same plane. And then within the helmet, they're all oriented uh, flat to the surface of the helmet. So trying to kind of hone into the brain underneath. This is another depiction. So if we take a better look at the, at the chip, um, yeah, it's about like uh, three centimeters in each direction. It has a magnetometer, which is the, the, the black line. So that's just a circle. Then it has a vertical radiometer, or sorry, a horizontal radiometer, whatever you want, <laughs> and, and the opposite. Um, if in the, by the way, if in the tutorial I say horizontal and vertical, you know it's not literally horizontal and vertical. It's horizontal and vertical to the surface of the helmet. So this is all, uh, all uh, free, uh, free flies in one stroke. And this is if you open the sensor, the, the, the system up here, you see all the chips. And then this will be all filled up with liquid uh, helium. Here you go. So you can do it, this is in the supine position. So it can be both rotated supine or it be, can be straight up. For many experiments, you probably would want it to be sitting up straight. Uh, so people are focused and they can see the buttons they're pressing. And, and, but, um, you can also do it supine, present visual stimuli, just like in fMRI with a mirror. Uh, I did some experiments at the Donders being supine because people move less, they can relax, especially if they're there a long time. So we have a specific, we have a, a, a mag compatible bed for people to lay in. And so also sleep research is great here because it's absolutely silent. And their mobile phone doesn't work either, so which is good. <laughs> In terms of sleep research, how do you deal with people move their hands? Because the EG electrodes, they go together. Yes, exactly. I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um. Oh. oh. Okay, wow, well, mute button. Um, so here, uh, here you have the system, like both uh, straight up and, uh, and supine. Everything, of course, is pneumatic because there's no, you don't want to have any metal uh, or electricity involved. And we can zoom out a bit further. This is a sketch of a lab. Here you have the MSR, here you have the MEG system. Um, all the equipment, so stimulus equipment, recording equipment, as much as possible is taken out of the room. Pretty much everything is taken out of the room because you don't want to introduce uh, uh, electricity in the room. Um, so most of it will use glass fiber for buttons, for cameras, for, for all of that. Okay. So to summarize this first part, magnetic fields are produced by synchronous postsynaptic currents in dendrites of pyramidal neurons. Um, MEG uses flux transformers coupled to squids to uh, measure these magnetic fields. And they're extremely small, so you need, uh, compared to environmental fields and noise, so you really need noise reduction techniques. And that's why we have the gradiometers. We have a magnetically shielded room, and we have active and internal active shielding. And in total, we pr typically have about 150 to 300 sensors, and we sample between like 1,000 hertz and 5,000 hertz. 
we sampled the experiment we're going to analyze with 1000 hertz but just to make sure that nobody that, that most laptops will be able to manage it I downsampled it to 250 hertz um, okay so does anybody know when I should be done <laughs> sorry um, anyway I was expecting Daniel or something to be here to give me five. But anyway, <laughs> MEG versus EEG uh, topographies. Uh, as I said, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how many of these mistakes are made in papers, okay? So really, don't make this mistake of, re of interpreting your topographies wrong. Um, and I hope that this will help you. Um, so on the left you have EEG, on the right you have MEG. Um, if we take an electric dipole, we take a dipole in the brain in EEG, we know it has to transverse the, uh, the brain boundary, then it has to transverse the CSF boundary, then it has to transverse the skull boundary, and then it has to transverse the scalp uh, through the gel to the electrode. And this generates typically a lot of spread of the EEG. Um, so Typically, based on topography of EEG, you have much less possibility of localizing the source. Uh, one added benefit, however, is that uh, everything that happens in the brain will be measured at every sensor. I mean, it's, a good, it's got pros and cons. Pros is that deeper sources you might be able to pick up with EEG, for instance. Um, in MEG, you have an di electric dipole which has a magnetic field which is not, does not have to be Condu conduced through uh, different media. And by the way, the problem here is not just the fact that it's that it's uh, that it has to go through a media. I mean, the problem would be much much less if we're just filled, uh, we're, we're just a, a balloon with uh, with salt water. The problem is is that these differences in boundaries, so differences of, of conductivity between the media. So the, the problem is between going from a very uh, low conductivity to a very high conductivity, for instance, from skull to scalp. The best thing you can do is to, uh, uh, to cut, cut away the scalp if you want to be good in EEG. <laughs> um, not drain the CSF anyway. Um, so for MEG, you don't have that problem at all. Magnetic fields go straight through. And another aspect is that with EEG, you always have a reference electrode. So you always are comparing two electrodes. The reference can be anywhere could be a, an average of all the electrodes, could be behind the mastoid, um, could be on the vertex. But this means that you are always influenced by the reference signal. So if you have a noise, noisy reference signal, you have noise in, in your data. And depending on what you take as a reference, your topography will look slightly different. Um, as I said, it is very strongly affected by differences in conductivity, by the changes of it. Um, which is not just a problem in a single subject, but it's a huge problem when comparing people and trying to do source modeling on, on, on subjects. Because also per subject, per, per patient or per person, this conductivity is different. Uh, people have thicker skull, thinner skull, and so the only way to kind of deal with it is to do a, a good segmentation of the brain, which we'll be doing, but still then you have to be able to estimate the conductivities, which is really, really hard. Uh, to do. So you typically use sort of standard measures, standard figures. Um, as I'm noticing now more than ever with 128 EEG electrodes, it takes a long time to prepare. If you compare this with MEG, it's really, really, really much, much faster. You just put the subject up and you're done. Um, as the comment was made, like you have standardized EEG positions, which is a good thing. So you always know pretty much where the electrode is. You don't know where the source necessarily is, but you at least know where you're measuring it. Um, and as I said, this makes it some a bit difficult, uh, the first part of mod modeling sources, but we'll get there. With MEG, we have an absolute signal. We have no reference, right? Um, and it's also not affected by differences or changes in conductivity. It's a very short preparation time. Um, and although source localization can be Theoretically much better, it is uh, quite of an elaborate procedure, as we'll see. Um, but less elaborate in a way than with EEG. They both have, they both have the unique aspects you have to deal with. Uh, with EEG, you have to deal with the different conductivities, so all the different uh, segments. 
you have to really segment the brain in all compartments. With MEG, you don't have to do that. But the point is that the person in the MEG can move around, so, and each head is different, and each head is positioned differently, so you don't necessarily yet know where the, elect where the sensors are relative to the head. We'll get to that. So that's one point, part you always have to do with MEG. And the last thing, so we don't have a reference signal, we have an absolute signal, but this signal depends on the distance to the sensors with uh, R to the third. This means that you typically are more sensitive to, to activity on the surface of the, uh, of, the, of the brain and less deeper. I mean, that really decays the sensitivity really strongly, uh, which again is a pro and a con. So, give you an example, uh, we have here what we'll see, the mismatch negativity, which is a, uh, in EEG is a frontocentral negative deflection. Uh, so this is EEG. If we look at it in uh, so an auditory mismatch negativity, I have to say, if we look at this, uh, this topography in the, using the magnetometers, we see a different, totally different picture. What we see here actually is that the dipoles are located here and oriented like that. So we have two dipoles, something that is not visible from the topography of EEG. It's a clear you know, example of why in some cases MEG is way superior. Um, because you might even be uh, assuming that there's some kind of anterior cingulate dipole or something like that. Now, if you take the planar gradi gradient, so the, we used to play the gradiometers, then we have a f even a more stronger, narrower picture of above the location of the dipoles. As you see, these match well with what you would sort of like estimate from the uh, right hand rule and these topographies. So this is the question of, uh, of how to deal with uh, a subject that is, uh, uh, well, we're dealing with, uh, with a helmet which has all the, all the sensors on the static place on the st and, and the head getting in instead of the EG being attached to the head. Um, think of it as that you have two coordinate systems. You have the coordinate system based on the head and you have a coordinate system based on the helmet. If you move the head, or you put the head in the, in the helmet, uh, the two coordinate systems don't match. Especially if you move it around, then the MEG coordinate system does not move around, but the subject does, coordinate system does. So one thing that we'll be doing uh, downstairs in a moment is to attach HPI coils, head position indicator coils. So these are little coils of color millimeters big. We place them on the subject's head with tape, typically. Uh, some labs use a, a sort of a, a swimming cap. Uh, about three or four or five of them. And they emit a small magnetic field. We localize these with respect to fiducial positions. So anatomical landmarks. Uh, Nasion, um, and here we do a position right above the ear. And then we digitize them in three-dimensional space using the polymers, which means that we know the location of the HPI coils in respect to the fiducial landmarks. Or the other way around, we know the fiducial landmarks in respect to the HPI coils. And what we then do is we put these HPI coils in, the, in headspace, which is defined by the fiducial coils, fiducial positions. So Typically, uh, through, the nose is, through, through the ears is the X direction, through the nose is the Y direction, and then we have the Z direction perpendicular to that. And then we put these people in the MEG system, where we hook up the HPI coils to the MEG system, and they emit small magnetic fields. Because, and in different frequencies, by the way. So it's, a, it's standard around 300 hertz, 360, 365, 370, etc. And these are picked up by the MEG and fry, via triangul triangulation or via dipole fit, if you'd like, uh, you know where these HPI coils are. So in this way, we can transform the, the sensors, which you typically do, to the head space of the, to the head coordinate system of the subject. Also, we can, we record this head position uh, throughout the recording. So afterwards, we can also compensate for head movements to some degree uh, by going back to the original position of the head. 
And, and this works well to, to several centimeters. Uh, the, the problem be becomes big when the subject gets out of the helmet and so it's not picking up the, the HPI uh, positions anymore. Yeah? So in the next step, what we do is we take the MRI, so we always scan an MR, and locate the same fiducial positions. Not only that, what we've also done and what we do downstairs is we not just localize the fiducial positions, but we scan the whole head shape. So we digitize in 3D about, let's say, 200 points of the, of the, of the scalp so that we're able to match this, the, these points onto the MRI and therefore transform the MRI, uh, the, the, the MEG sensors, which is transformed to the head space, to the MRI. Yeah, so far. I know this is a little bit more elaborate than EEG. Um, and then finally what we do, uh, what we'll be doing is we segment the brain. And because we now know the position of the MEG and EEG electrodes in respect to the, uh, to the MRI, we know it in respect to the segmented brain and two surfaces that we can then make from the segmented brain. So what you see here is the MEG sensors and in red the EEG sensors because instead of doing a whole head shape we uh, I, I take, took the effort of putting e each EEG electrodes localizing them on the head so I know at the same time now exactly where the EEG electrodes were on the head and in addition we typically like, put a little bit of like extra put the nose on there the eyebrows some things that help us fit uh, uh, this head shape onto the MRI Uh, with EEG, it's a little bit more uh, important. It's much more important to, um, to segment all three compartments. So the brain, the skull, and the scalp. And we'll do some image processing to make sure that this is going okay. Because what, of course, is to, should not be happening is that they, they cross each other. Because the mathematical models assume uh, one inside the other. But we'll be doing this as well. So, almost there. How am I on time? Anyone? <laughs> Over time already? Coffee is oh. yeah. You have 45 minutes, is that right? Left. Left. Wow. Yeah. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Yeah. Oh, anyway. As I said, some things go different. Um, so, <laughs> what we end up with with MEG and EEG and what will be uh, kind of the space we'll be tra traveling through uh, this week is first of all we have a fantastic uh, time resolution. So we can do event related potentials and we can look at uh, raw data. Fields. 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 <laughs> Fields and potentials. We'll do both. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We'll do every, everything we do. Uh, we compare EEG and MEG. Um, we have space because we can now also do source localization. This is a beamformer, uh, but we we'll also do dipole fitting. And we'll look at the scalp topographies. We have frequency. We can we'll do FFTs, uh, so look at the frequency distribution of the data. And we can, of course, combine time and frequency, so we get a time frequency distribution. And here, for instance, we have uh, alpha suppression. Then we can take space and time and look at things like Grange causality, which we'll not be doing, but we'll be talking about it. Um, similarly, we will be not doing it, but we'll be talking about it is uh, combining uh, space, time, and frequency and look at things like coherence. And then for each version, there are different analysis methods that we'll be applying uh, or deciding. So to conclude this uh, very short introduction, <laughs> is uh, this second part is that EEG deals with relative signals, uh, MEG with absolute signals. And this means that EEG is sensitive to placement and noise of the reference sensor. And we already saw that MEG is sensitive to a lot of other noise. Um, MEG is not sensitive to uh, differences in, in, in conductivity. Uh, and it has potentially a, a better spatial resolution. Um, but it's, it requires a little bit more steps in between. 
interpretation of the MEG gradiometers and magnetometers needs a little bit of a you know step back. You have to kind of really think like not not always the biggest color is above the source, and the right hand rule is something you'll be be using. Um, the MEG is much more comfortable, I think, and uh, on long run and, and a quicker setup than uh, especially high density EEG. Um, both are except exceptionally silent, of course, and what we'll be seeing, I guess, in the analysis as well, I did my best with the EEG, but you always have channels that are off. And, and they also always have different variants. So the difference in variance between channels is, is, is a problem we'll, we can encounter in, for instance, dipole fitting. Uh, with MEG, uh, you have signal to noise, which is, depends on, for instance, distance to the helmet. Uh, but for the rest, it's much more homogeneous and, um, and easier to work with and quicker to set up. So this is my introduction. Um, are you?